I'm a native of the USA. I was born in a town called Hoboken, New Jersey. Uh, that's up in the Northeast. Um, for, for people that may or may not know this, it was the birthplace of someone like Frank Sinatra. Um, the first the first American baseball game, professional baseball game, was played there many, many, many years ago. Uh, I, I'm somebody who went to public schools uh, for, for the latter part of my secondary education. And then when I went to college, um, I actually didn't go right to college. I, was, I went to trade school. And so when I left high school, I went to uh, a place called Lincoln Technical Institute for air conditioning, refrigeration, and heating repair. And so I did that for a year. Then I went to college, uh, went to a, a, a college in New York City called Pace University downtown, right across from City Hall. Uh, and then from there, I went to the University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine in Philadelphia. So I did four years of college, four years of, of, uh, of dental school. I did a residency in Pittsburgh in a hospital, which general dentists do not have to do residencies. It's something you can opt to do. And I took the option and did that. It was a very rewarding experience for me. I love Pittsburgh. Then I came out of my residency and I practiced in the state of, uh, in the state of New Jersey, in Rutherford, New Jersey, for around seven years, seven and a half years before I went back to school, sold my practice. And I went back to school at the University of Rochester in Rochester, New York, uh, where I did my master's and PhD in biochemistry, which took me about five years. Um, and then from there, I went to do a postdoctoral research fellowship at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, I get tired even telling the story. I was there for three years. Uh, my, my, my focus of, of my research, people assume it was dentistry. It wasn't. When I did my PhD, it was in DNA structure and function. When I did my postdoc at the NIH, we were doing, uh, head, uh, we were doing cancer research with, with uh, uh, free radical generation and, and uh, trying to prevent that. And using gene therapy to put certain enzymes, I'm getting way off track here, into cells to try and protect the salivary glands from what's called the secondary effects of radiation damage. After I finished that, and I went, I was employed at Marquette Dental School in uh, Milwaukee, where I stayed for 12 years. When I was there, I was the uh, director of a clinic there, which had the special needs clinic, emergency clinic, as well as my residency program. Uh, called the Advanced Education and General Dentistry Program. I was that I was director of those three things for about 12 years up there. Then I came down here to uh, Augusta, Georgia, uh, in 2016, about August of 2016, where I assumed the role of uh, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Advanced Education, and that's what I've been doing ever since. And that's just a way of saying that my my office is concerned with the entire pre-doctoral pre -doctoral, uh, uh, curriculum and education as well as all eight of our graduate residencies. And we have eight of them, two general dental residencies and six specialties. So it's a very busy office um, and I, it's, it's, it's a fun thing to do. Some of it's real, real serious. Um, but when I was the most, pro I'll say this to you, the most progress I made in calligraphy when I was doing my PhD, uh, that's where I really made progress because I was a student again. And um, uh, I, I didn't know anything about organized calligraphy. And so I went down to the Office of Biochemistry and Biophysics at, at Rochester to see somebody about a, a, a curriculum thing I, I had, was having an issue with. And so I walked in the door and I see these name placards on the wall that were hand done. And I was knew enough about calligraphy to know somebody did that. They were beautiful. They were illuminated. So I remember asking the woman in, in the office, did you do this? She says, no, Annabelle did. And so she introduced me to Annabelle Kowalski. Uh, and then she told me about the local calligraphy guild, which I knew nothing about. But she also, I also asked her, I says, do you know Mr. Bill Lilly? I says, I, I've been in touch with him on the phone. And she says, oh, Joe, in two weeks, the Iampeth convention is going to be here in Rochester. And I'm like, what's Iampeth? And so she told me. And so in 1999, in August of 1999, I went to the, I was still doing research. I had experiments going. So I would take a break and then drive to the convention, take a class, and then have to go back and finish up my experiments. But it was literally a life changer for me because it really started me on a path of, when I first did this, I was writing whatever way I wanted to, what I liked. I just simply used the oblique pen holder to, to write any, I wasn't looking at styles or anything. So, so when I went there, all of a sudden I became extremely serious about it. And so that was really the changing point in my life when it comes to calligraphy. It had been probably about 1998 to 99. Yeah, I had started calligraphy earlier than that. What, what I consider calligraphy, I was trying to, the, the, what actually got me interested initially in calligraphy in general and illumination was the biblical manuscripts that were handwritten in the medieval, in the Middle Ages. 
and so and uh, the Renaissance period. So I was fascinated by illuminated script, illuminated text, and things like that. And so I actually studied quite a bit of that technique. I was making my own gessos. I was using the Chinini recipe, uh, gold leaf. Uh, and I, I loved doing that stuff. I even did some of that with script. Uh, so that started me on the path. And then the idea of a rom the romantic idea of a handwritten letter, you know, came into my mind. And I, the, the thing that I imagined was script, right? You know, the shaded script. And I didn't realize it was a grocery script or whatever then. Um, so I pursued that. And I got the first book I ever picked up was Eleanor Winter's book, uh, Copper Plate. Um, I think it was called Mastering Copper Plate. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's the book I started with. And so I, I was using that loosely. Uh, but making my own letter forms and, and uh, thought I was doing well. Everybody's complimenting me on how beautiful this stuff was. And now when I look at it, you know, well, I will say this to you, though, Olivia, I, I, I still show that early work to people. Of course, it's important that, that, that novices understand that you're not born doing this. There are some people like my friend Jake Weidman, who's incredibly gifted with art, artist, artistic ability, but you can learn this, this art form. Does it help to have natural artistic ability? I'm sure it does. But, you know, I have average artistic ability, maybe a little above average, but still, if I could do it, anybody can do it. It's a matter of method. And are you willing to put the time and dedication into doing it? That's the real key. Most people want to learn it, but the, the dedicated time and it never, one of the most important things is never accept what you're doing is the best you can do. And I was always looking for something better. And, um, uh, I've been I've been quoted many times. Quote I've, I've said many times that you know I've never written anything that I've, I was completely happy with. It might seem it might seem weird to say that, but the only way you you get better is by striving to get better. If you become complacent, and the other thing I've always said, if I ever thought my script was the equivalent of someone like Willis Bears or Luffers, I would put my pen down and never touch it again. For me, it's about the journey towards that point. And uh, so, yeah, I started back then in about 93, 95. But for all those years, I was just, I didn't even know how to ink the pen, to be honest with you. I used to wrap the, the nib around with, with, with orthodontic rubber bands, just to make, like a reservoir. I couldn't, get, I couldn't get the ink to stay on the pen. And it wasn't until I met John DeColibus in 99, he showed me how to do that. So. No. no, you can achieve moments of it. I think for me, uh, there was a, a thing I post all the time about some study of, of spacing where I wrote the word sunny in lowercase, S-U-N-N-Y. You may have seen it, may not, but I asked the question, is it possible to get so perfect in your spacing that it becomes hard to read? And so I, I, I altered the connectors. And I, if, you, if you remind me, I'll post a picture to you. I recently posted it and it became very difficult to read. Uh, but it's it's the only thing I've ever felt that I I, I achieved what I was after, um, and it, it, the the problem with what I'm saying now is that for some people I don't criticize my work anymore because people make it you know they'll, they'll, they'll think you're trying to be falsely immodest you were looking for you're hunting for you know compliments but it's a hard thing I mean we we you know to to, to get once you get to go from beginner to intermediate takes work but it can be done relatively easily. Go from intermediate to advanced takes a lot more work. To go from advanced to the level of a guy like Lupfer or Willis Baird, now you're not talking about necessarily moving, you're talking about perception with your eye. Can you see the issues? And so as I was progressing in this, and I'd go to an Iampeth meeting, I'd meet with John, because there weren't many people around that could criticize what you're doing if you're looking for that level of high-grade script. And so John DeColibus is one of them. He would sit there and say, this looks good, this looks good. And he would tell me, you're a little off on here. And you know, my initial reaction as a ego-driven person is like, get out, it's that, that, that's, that's fine. And I'd go away and think about it for a while. And I'd say, okay, maybe he's right. But to be able to see that difference. Uh, I've, I posted studies where I, I write like the, the, the lowercase I forms, a bunch of them. They all look identical. Then you put a connector, a dot, and, it, and an exit struggle also becomes UIW. You know, it's that kind of insight that, and I didn't come up with that myself. That was told to me by uh, Del, Del Tisdale. He's now gone. Uh, but, you know, you see, you, you, you did all these gems and you put them together. Uh, and I wanted to make sure, Olivia, that 
you know, when I first came into this, I was not the first person ever to, you know, to, to, to post stuff out there. There were people like a guy named Ross Green on the Spencerian channel. Of course, Michael Sull was in it long before I was. Bill Lilly. Um, and, and so when I came out, but it was, I didn't know about this. And the internet really wasn't, you know, the, what it is now. It wasn't this, this. So I was you know, really struck by how barren it was, the desert of, uh, for me, what I was trying to do, calligraphy, even though there's an active, there's active guilds in, in England and all over the world, but I didn't know that. So I wanted to make sure if there was anybody else that wanted to learn this form that I, I, I was passionate about and I love, that they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be alone in trying to figure this out. So um, to give you an example, many years ago, I was told by a good friend of mine, Kathy Saunders, that you know, there were these incredible books that nobody's ever seen, like the Mataraz book. And, you know, I'm, I'm like, what do you mean no one's ever seen it? She said, well, people that have it won't even let you look at it. I'm like, what? what? I didn't understand that because I'm a man of books. I'm, a, you know, learned, I, 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 an academic. And so Kathy was kind enough to actually give me one of her two copies of the Madaraz book. That night, literally that night, I went home, took my scanner and scanned the thing cover to cover. What you see is the Madaraz book online is the thing I scanned many, many years ago. And I immediately started making at the time CD-ROMs with the books on it. And I would just, all I would ask for is just pay me the money for shipping. And I shipped them all over the world. It was, it was insane to me that you as somebody who's new to this could not have access to that book. And so I started scanning everything I could find. And, uh, and other people started joining in. And so uh, it, it was uh, just to make sure that, you know, you had information and that I, you were given the same kindness I was given by folks like Bill Lilly and John and Michael. Uh, to, to, to get me beyond a certain point. So if you look at my earliest work, there's actually an image I post that show early, 1999 before I amped and then 1999 after I and you could see an, a marked difference. And, uh, and then of course, by I say by about 2001, 2002, I was about as probably good as I've been. Uh, I'm not saying great, I'm not saying perfect, but you know, and there are people, I know this, there are people out there that are better than I ever was. I mean, David Grimes is one of them. There's a guy in China, Richie Wei. There's other people. I mean, you've got people like Michael Ward now with ornamental penmanship that actually use that kind of movement. So, anyway. That's a great question. So here's, there's a, there's a few, it's no one answer to that. You know, for me, I was after this idea the idea of the perfection I perceived in someone like Luck for Script. But to be honest with you, and this, this, this people can misunderstand this, once you know a certain level of how to do this, then you start to realize there is no perfect script out there. There are people who came really close. For instance, Louis Mataraz, A.D. Taylor. These are people that, if I didn't hold their specimens in my hand, I wouldn't believe the human hand did it. You can see these things that I am, but they have a Mataraz scrapbook. They have work by A.D. Taylor. And so it was, that was that, but it really depends on the person. You know, when I first got into this, I told you it was the idea of writing someone, you know, my girlfriend, a letter, you know, a beautifully written letter. Uh, now, if you just write in any hand, it doesn't matter calligraphy or not, people are incredibly impressed when you give them something handwritten. Uh, so that's what really started me. It really depends on your own journey. My mind is very analytical. That's why I went into science and all that stuff, you know, and so I, I, for me, the, the fun thing about script was how do I break it down? If you've ever seen any of my articles, for instance, the capital D, I, I still have trouble with that letter, but I broke that down into fundamental shapes and principles. And I know David's been doing a lot of that stuff as well. So we all have our own reasons to come to this. Do I want, do I want to just write like Lupford? No. I think you should be able to use some flair in that and, 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 and create your own style. But where I think people sometimes go off the rails with it a little bit is they it's so far away from the fundamentals, you can't recognize them anymore. And I'll give you a good example of that. Someone like Mike Keksik, um, he does his own um, uh, uh, variations, script variations. They're beautiful. But I know Mike understands the fundamental forms. He studied that early on. What we, see, what we have sometimes here is that people will skip the fundamentals and go right to the, what, they, what they want. And that's fine. If you want to have fun with it, that's perfectly fine. My brain is different. Someone like David Grimes' brain works in a similar way to mine, I think, when it comes to script. You know, we're, we're after something different, and it's all okay. Where, where you can get yourself into problems is trying to say that you're doing a certain form of script and you're not. 
Um, uh, and if you talk about Zanarian and Grosser script, for instance, well, what form are we talking about? Are we talking about the Lupfer Zanarian manual? We're we talking about the C.P. Zaner one that predated Lupfer's. You know, Lupfer's one came out, I think, in 1918. Zaner's was before that. So whose script are we talking about? And I'll have people ask me questions like, well, what about lifting at the baseline and then starting again at the top? No, no, no. There was an article, and unfortunately, I cannot find it. Uh, I literally have, have gone through all of the old penmanship journals year by year. And uh, Lupfer wrote an article, and I can't remember what, which journal it was in, where he said, you know, the reason why we do this is to give students a chance to stop and think about where they're going. Now, people would say to me, well, you know, it's really the, so you don't pick up paper fibers and, and get smears. Well, if that's the case, how could you do ornamental penmanship? There's no picking up of the pen. They do these wide sweeping swirls. There's no fibers picked up. And so the ironic thing is, is that you know, I've said this many times on other interviews where where. Someone like me, whose script is maybe more closely aligned with the Zanarian manual, and John the Columbus, while he started with that, now his script looks more like Louis Madaraz's grocery script. Madaraz was somebody who was pretty much against lifting the pen. He's in, in writing, he's saying that he felt it, it disrupts the dance of the pen, whereas Lufford taught pen lifts. And so I write more like Lufford, but with no pen lifts. John writes more like Madaraz, but he uses pen lifts. It depends on what you like, what you can use and what you can make, you know, make use of and what works for you. Uh, you got to be very careful, in, in my opinion, in calligraphy to be very not to be too dogmatic. Uh, you'll have people who want to use certain terminology. If you don't use it, they get upset. I, I don't have any room to get upset with people with this. I mean, I want to keep people in it. Everything I did in the way of instructional materials and other things was to try and keep a novice in. Because that mm -hmm. oblique pen holder is very difficult to learn to use. The sharp pointed dip pen, learn, difficult to learn to use. And you have a lot of people that start with a lot of desire. They get so frustrated that they leave it. So I wanted to try. And my work can help a novice or an advanced person. Uh, and so that was the whole goal of what I wanted to do. And now there's so many different people out there. Nina Tran. You got folks in, you know, in, in the Asian. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, um, I, I think my one of my, I know my, 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 book, the one that can be printed, uh, was recently translated into Spanish. Uh, somebody translated something of mine into uh, some form of Chinese, I think. Um, me. Oh, is that you? Yes. Oh, sorry. I, I'm sorry. I never connected yeah. the face. Yeah, sorry, Olivia. Uh, so, you know, and I, I really, I really admire that. I'm very thankful for that. I even had one guy in another country, well, well the, the, the country will remain nameless, was somewhere in Eastern Europe where someone told me he was selling my book with his name on it. In other words, it took my name off of it. And so I told him, I says, listen, you tell him, put my name back on and he can still sell the book and make a profit. I didn't sell that, but if he wants, if he needs the money that bad, he can keep it. But you know, that book I put out for free because I wanted people to know what I knew. Uh, I was also in a fortunate position in life. I didn't have to worry about making my money that way. And I'll tell you, sometimes I regret it because to the best of my knowledge, when I, the last time I checked between my personal server and Apple Doc, an Apple server, I think the book has been downloaded in excess of 100,000 times. And so I wish I would have charged $2 to down, download. You know, <laughs> I would have donated the money, but, you know, it's, it's yeah. So I think uh, I forgot the original question, but yeah, two dollars, even a dollar would have been interesting. So. So I think sometimes my my you know if you've seen any of my evaluations and my 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 analysis, you know why I use lots of lots of slant angles and lots of ovals, imaginary ovals. So the best way to do this, in my opinion, is again it, this comes down to learning to run before you learn to walk. So mm -hmm. the best way, if I was doing this again, I would study making ovals and keeping compound curves on the slant angle. You know, and then you look at how the oval helps form a compound curve, but you don't think about that as you're writing it. You write and then go back and evaluate. And that's what I used, I used to do. I used to take my script and put it into PowerPoint and start evaluating whether or not things were consistent. And if it wasn't, I would work on that one thing. You know, I don't really did I ever sit down and just start to write pretty, pretty script. I just wanted to, to, to optimize my letter forms. 
And so I would do it just the way I showed you guys. You know, I, I checked the slant angles. I checked the ovals. I checked the spacing. And if something was wrong, I'd go back to fundamentals and find out, you know, what, what, what makes spacing consistent in, in grocery script? Well, the size of those imaginary ovals. If, you're, if your oval is wide in one part and narrow in another and wide again, all of a sudden you've got inconsistent letter spacing. And the exercise I did that shows, um, I think it was Earl Lupfer's, um, what was the word he, he wrote there? He wrote a word where I showed just the lower third of the, of the X height. And you can't tell which letter is which. They look identical. And so, you know, that's something else I worked on. I'd go back and I'd take a word I wrote and look at the bottom third of it and see, the, the, does an I look like an I, an O look like an O? They should all be the same bottom. When you start to do that, you start to touch upon what the old masters used to be able to do. Um, you know, and that's another thing, just, just for clarification, you know, I have no problem. Somebody wants to, you know, people use the term master all the time. I, I do not use that in the associated with myself. The only time I would accept that as a term, if somebody meant it in the way of teacher, then I would be okay with the use of that. You know, for me, I just like we, we practice medicine, we practice dentistry. That implies that you never master it. You always have to learn or else not your, your patients could be hurt by what you don't know. And so I take the same approach to script writing. Anybody who uses the term, that's fine. I, God bless you, I, whatever you want to do. But for me, it's not a, as I said, perfection. I, I always say perfection is not a destination, it's a journey. So for me, I have to continue on that journey when I was doing it. Uh, my hands aren't what they used to be. Um, I had some issues with diabetes and, and, and pain in my hands and feet. Uh, not that that's a big thing. <laughs> you worry about that, but. You know, and I don't think I could do the same level of script I did at one time. I mainly just use fountain pens right now and uh, occasionally might do some shaded work. But, um, you know, I think it's important to to know how to practice. And I actually wrote an article on practice. Uh, you know, if you got there was a time I had lots of trouble with stem loops, especially ascender stem loops. And so I would work for days on that. Now, most people don't have my kind of weirdness to be able to work on one thing for that long, you know, but. I would get it down until I, until I could do it in my sleep. Um, yesterday, on, on a, on a, I, I gave a little talk to David's, um, David Grimes' class. And, I, you know, so as I said, I, I talked about this the Zen master from a, a book called Zen in the Art of Archery. He's a brush, a writing master in Japan. And he passed a comment that, you know, the brush must make the, the, the stroke at the moment the mind's eye conceives it, no hesitation, which means you have to know it so well. You don't think about what you're doing. Once you start getting involved and where's the pen going, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. and so I got to a point where for me it was pure joy. I could just go down and start writing the letter for yes. Did I make mistakes? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that could sometimes catch people is they all they could see is mistakes. That happened to me at one time. No matter what I wrote, all I could see was mistakes. And you got to get beyond that because you have to realize your hand will never be perfect, never will be. People may think it is, but it's not. And so you have to be able to, to, to smack yourself in the face and move on, you know, or, not, or you'll stop writing completely. Remind me of study as much as you write, right? That's the, what love for said. Mm, yeah, there's, there's a lot of people that think there's different quotations about that. For me, you've heard that there used to be an old saying, practice makes perfect. You know, so, practice makes permanent. And so you, if you're practicing mistakes, they're going to be hard to change. Practice makes permanent, yes, but practice just leads to more practice. You know, you have to do correct practice. Years ago, I was a competitive archer, bow and arrow, and uh, uh, I, had a, I had a coach. I was an Olympic-level coach, and he told me, he says, Joe, he says, 30 minutes of correct practice will be three hours of bad practice any day. And I took that to heart because even when I was in my graduate program, I didn't have time to sit down and write for hours. So I would get up just the way people get up and run. I get up, sit at my desk and for 30 minutes, practice forms. And this way, when I finally got to, down to write the letter, I didn't have to worry about those things anymore. But as I said, there are still forms that, that bug me, like the capital D is something that bugs me. Um, you know, a hard stroke for many beginners is, is a lowercase p with a long vertical straight line. Mm. And it's not easy to do, so... If, if you if you take a look at my book, the first few pages talk about the history of this. And so mm -hmm. the, the form you're actually referring to is, is, is English roundhand. 
And uh, that was a form of handwriting that was originally done with a feather pen, a feather quill. It wasn't a sharp point. It was cut to a narrow, broad edge. And there's a book by uh, uh, Bickham. Uh, I think it's the Young Accountant's Handbook that talks about how to cut the pen for that. Uh, but that was a form of, of, of shaded writing done with the feather quill pen as a form of handwriting. Okay. At some point, what they would do to, to produce those books is they would the, the, the English writing master would give his work to a master engraver. And they would engrave that script for printing, the intaglio printing method. And they would engrave onto a copper plate for printing. And somewhere, we're not sure where, the earliest uses of the term copper plate I found was in a Sir Ambrose Heal 1930s book that was uh, English, uh, co English um, writing masters in their copy books. The earliest time I've seen the term copper plate used was because of that printing method that stuck on. And so we now use copper plate ubiquitously all over the place. It could People think Spencerian's copper plate, they think grocery script is copper plate. There's a lot of confusing terminology. And I, I tried to I tried to get to the bottom of that for people. But and some people, like my my uh, uh former mentor Bill Lilly, you'd never want to say copper plate to Bill. You know, that's something he didn't like. And uh, me, I honestly I know what the differences are. If you come to hear me talk, I will tell you what the history is there. Um, uh, there's not one form of round hand. There's not one form of engrosser script. I mean, if you look at the slant angle on Madarazis engrosser script, very different than the Luffer script. You know, it's more angled. Um, he didn't lift his pen up. They had different letter forms. Uh, so I think people get sometimes trapped into this idea of, what am I writing, copper plate or? No, I would say if you want to write, if you want to write engrosser script like, like I've done or David Grimes says, there's ways to do that. Copper plate is, has a different look to it. I would say someone like uh, Paul Antonio does something that's a little closer. To, I mean, it's, it's, it's round hand, um, English round hand. I get, would, could you call it copper plate? Yes, but there are some purists that don't want to hear that. Uh, I, the reason why I'm not as big into the name game and get upset with all that stuff is I was giving a, a demonstration and a talk in Milwaukee at one of those Michael's art stores. And the, the room had a big glass front to it so people could walk by in the store and see the, the class going on. And we kept seeing a woman come back and forth, looking in the room, walk past, come back, look in the room, what I was doing on the board. And so finally, Debbie Ziner, past president of IAMPA, went out there to, to speak to her. And she says, can I help you? And the woman was very indignant. She's like, well, I didn't know you were teaching copper play because I, I, I put the flyer out as in grocery script. And she was like, I would have taken this class if I would have known he was doing copper plate. And so ever, ever since then, I'm not, I could tell you the differences and I tell everybody who takes my, used to take my workshops and in my books, what the differences are, but I'm less concerned about that now. Uh, but a, a grocery script is an American form of round hand on some level. Round hand was writing and grocery script was never writing. And grocery script was the drawing of letters. Bill Lilly used to call it, Luff, Luffert would refer to it as, as engraving on paper. So it's not a form of handwriting. The form of handwriting in this country that was developed, as you know, is Spencerian script. And so while there's not one codified form of round hand or engrosser script, there's a few engrosser script. In, 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 in Spencerian, there is an original form. The progenitor form was from Platt Roger Spencer Sr. You can go back and find that very delicately shaded, you know, not heavy shades. Uh, and then what moved beyond that was someone like A.N. Palmer's work on business penmanship, because it's very difficult to teach children shading and they can barely learn to write a letter. So, you know, Palmer basically stripped out the, the, the uh, changed, optimized the form maybe a little bit, but took away the shading. Even in, in, in England. You know, there was a point it was the only people that could write it and read it were the English writing masters. So it had to be a, a, low, a, a more common form. Uh, and that's happened throughout the centuries. I mean, Egypt, when, even when we had Egyptian hieroglyphics, there was something called the hieratic form, which is basically an everyday common usage of the form. Uh, so um, I think I forgot the original question you asked me, but I would say, <laughs> is copper plate the way to start? No. Yes, no. It depends on what you want. If you want to write, English round hand, let's say in the way Paul Antonio does it, then you start there. Uh, the hardest thing, in my opinion, to learn, in my opinion, to learn, there's two forms that are really difficult. One is the ornamental penmanship that you see someone like Michael Michael Ward do. 
because it requires, you watch him, he's not moving his fingers. He's rocking off his elbow off the, off the table. And the second hardest form in, in my, I mean, in gross script is difficult, but I would say Roman capitals, you know, the Trajan alphabet, that's a very, but unfortunately people get into these arguments, what's better, what's, you know, people, we should not be a house divided. It's all good stuff, you know, but to argue what's better, what's harder, you know, it makes no sense to me. You know, it's not like, you know, people insist on calling what we do is a craft, arts and craft. No, no, it's an art form. And I, that's the one thing I, I, I require people to say when they talk to me. It's an art form. It's not a craft. You, there's craft involved in what we do, technique, mm-hmm. craft. But, you know, I, as I said last time, when I was talking on, on David's site, I can find art in a single letter. And it happens that I amp it. When I was there, we used to sit down in the room for hours. And we would break down Madaraz's lowercase s, had at least an hour and a half conversation on that. Other people would think you're weird or, or there's something wrong with you, you know, but anyway. Well, yeah. the grocery script and the engraver script, they're only different in this way. When, in this country, when, when, when the, the engrosser, who was basically what was the calligrapher of the day, wanted to emulate the round hand of England, they had a certain way of doing it. And so because the engrosser was doing that, they called it engrosser script. But engravers who used to engrave jewelry and watches, mm-hmm. if you look at some of the old watches, they're beautifully engraved with script. And all of a sudden became engraver script. So yes, from that standpoint, it is different. Um, copper plate, as it is defined today, by someone like uh, Eleanor Winter's book, that would be different than, say, the, the, the script of John Eyre as a writing master from England years and years ago. Um, but I wouldn't get as hung up on that because people get so confused. What happens when you take someone who does like Madaraz? They do ornamental capitals with engrosser script lowercase, or they mix engrosser script with ornamental script. It's, it's people start getting, oh my God, what do I call it? I don't really care. I mean, <laughs> right, what you think is pretty. You know, okay. so don't get too hung up in what I call the name game. Mm-hmm. You know, it's important to know that if you want, read my little section of my book and you'll get an idea of what it is. I, I wrote articles like deep find the, you know, the oblique pen holder, different types of script. But I see I see people get so hung up and some of them get really nervous and they come up and talk to you. They don't know what to call. They're afraid you're going to, you know, yell at them or something. No, I, I saw whatever you want to call it. Uh, mm-hmm. But yes, yeah, there are differences. But in the end, you just need to understand what you're doing and what your goal is. Uh, if you want to write pretty in your own style, that's perfectly fine. Uh, if you want to call yourself a master, then there's certain you have to think you have to do to be able to set that mark. And um, you know, I don't know. I just I think it should be. Here's the thing. In the end, it should all be fun. If it becomes yeah. unfun, don't do it anymore. Yeah. You know, some people get so I guess get caught up in whether it's perfect or I'm, I'm making mistakes and. You know, I can't see it. Then, then put the pen down for a while and then come back to it later. Mm-hmm. Same thing with me. See all these guitars behind me. I've been playing guitar since I was a little boy. And lately, I don't really have fun doing it. You know, if I'm recording music or something, I, it, it's more tedious for me. But yet, I'm on YouTube and I see these young kids playing their instruments and you see smiles on their face. It reminds me of why I started this to begin with. You know, sometimes you can get old and jaded, and, and, and uh, but you got to find the joy in it. If you don't find the joy, Put the pen down, do something else. I think I think it's because that was a form that lent itself to beautiful wings and stuff. But I've 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 emulated dragons from from CP Zayner. Um, mm-hmm. I've emulated rabbits. Um, I've actually demonstrated how to do them with the fountain pen. Um, it's just I mean, if you look at did you have the book from that that has love for his name on it called ornate pictorial calligraphy? Mm-hmm. They have some other, they have some other animals in there as well, but it's not just. I mean, if I asked John the Colobus at the time when he was like you know really doing this a lot, I said, John, what about doing one of those stags, you know, like a deer? He said, Joe, all you do is trace the outline of it and then just fill it with swirls. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like you have to have, but there are some people who have gotten very creative. There's someone who, I think Belinda Chin, I think it is. She did a beautiful owl. I love owls. Belinda, yeah. Yes, and I, I, you know, that's if I was still doing that, that's what I would try and emulate. I love owls. I just picked up some really fancy fountain pens with owls on them. I've had owls engraved on the on the pen points, and 
And um, but it, it, if you could create it, do it. You know, I've seen recently uh, in one of my uh, images on Facebook that was a, you know, I, something I posted in the past that came up again was a cat. You know, I mean, any yeah. of those, but you're right. Most people, it, it's they they use birds. And for me to do something quickly, because true offhand flourishing, and I don't claim to be the greatest at it, but, you know, I can do a bird in less than, I don't know, 30 seconds. You know, I don't sit there and do this. If you watch, I could, I could send links to, have you seen my fate, my YouTube channel? Yes. yes. Okay, I have scripting the copper plate style is one thing. I have fountain pens. I have penmanship. So there's a whole bunch of things to look through. But, you know, the true offhand flourishing was done rel relatively quickly. It was used by penmen who would travel from town to town in the 1800s. And they'd set up on the street corner and they would flourish to impress people. So they would send their children to them and get paid oh. them to teach them how to write. That's where it came from. So it had to be done very quickly. But there are some forms of flourishes that were done very intensely and, 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 and took time to do. There's a, there's a very famous eagle by C.P. Zayner. And that looks like it was, you know, that was, we believe that was done, I mean, offhand, but planned. Um, and you'll see some of Jake Weidman's stuff when he does a video where he'll pre-draw things and then go over it. And the whole goal of those penmen from the past was to get it right. No. 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 But I will say this. Michael Ward uses the lender principle 122, you know, uh, 101. He actually he actually prepares the tip himself. I could never do that. I don't have the patience for it. Um, but I will say that the, the, the story of the Leonard principle, and the, the principle, you may or may not know this, but it was Brian Walker of England who's now gone. He's deceased. But he contacted the Leonard uh, company and, and got them to make that Leonard principle pen. Uh, and he contacted a few of his friends. I was one of them to, to interact with Leonard. I gave them a write-up on what I, my thoughts were on the, on the, on the Gillette Principality, or what they actually called the Gillette Principality. And so I gave him my thoughts on what I thought would make a good pen point. And they took all that and melded. Bob Herford, I think, was involved and a few others. Uh, and then they came out with that pen. Now, is it a good pen? Yeah, it's a good pen. The, 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 the difference is quality control. You can get a box of new nibs. You know, a gross box is 144 of them. And if you take them and separate the tines on your fingernail, they should be dead even. Both tines should be the same size, and the slit should go right down the middle. But a lot of the pens that don't. I've had, I've had instances in the past where, you know, like a Hunt, was the Hunt 22 or a 101? You know, on a box of 100, I might only get maybe 10 that were usable to me. You know, so and that so a, a novice picks up one of those pens, they're not well, and all of a sudden it starts sticking into the paper. You know, the angle, the angle of the of the flange to the pen staff is also important. If it's too steep, it's gonna stick into the paper. If it's too acute, you know, you're gonna stick it into the paper. But everybody I've also published images on modern pen and the different, you know, my preference, which has changed over the years, and others who you know what how they like to write. It's just it's not one size fits all. Uh, you'll see people who, you know, hold a, they got a pen in their hand. And some people hold it and which are considered the, the regular. Other people do this, two yeah. fingers, you know. So I've seen people three fingers, you know, or they, they put it in between their hands like that. You know, if that's the way you write, okay, but it, could, it may make some of these forms more difficult. What's unfortunate, though, is that the, the you know, the, the nib, whether you're right-handed or left-handed, it's a nib, Okay. The reason why I like those vintage points is, well, for a few reasons. The quality control is pretty high. For mm -hmm. a box of 100 vintage principalities or muzzle imperfections, you know, you might only find one or two that were not good versus what you got. Because they, if you ever seen the pictures they make, well, the, the drawings of them making it, they have these long rooms. And usually it was women at every single station because they claim they had smaller hands, they can do it better. But they would, you know, individually worked every nib and they would check every nib by hand. They don't think if they did that today, you know, it would be impossible to purchase them. And yeah. just so you know, as somebody who's a fountain pen user, you know, we're making some of the finest nibs ever made today, but for mm -hmm. fountain pens. So if you buy a, a Mont Blanc 149, for instance, that's got an incredible, this is a platinum one. That's got an incredible 18 karat gold nib on there. I don't know if you can see that, but that's a, that's an incredible nib. 
but the pen is ridiculously expensive. You know, so to get, could we make, could we make Jalap principalities today? Yes, we could. If we were willing to sell them for like 25 bucks a piece, 40 bucks a piece. And you can't do that. You just can't do that. So uh, you know, at one time I had lots of these types of nibs because I, I, I went after them and I spent lots of money. Uh, but I had, you know, eight boxes of, of muzzle imperfections. I had over 10 boxes of Spencerian number ones. But, you know, mm. today it's impractical. You look at on eBay, and I admit to being probably responsible for that kind of, when I post that Dream Nibs picture. Uh, but what are you going to do with the pen that costs 30, 40, 50 bucks and get one of them? You know, yep. when I was doing high grade work. I might, I might go through, you know, what I consider high grade work, uh, you know, a single page. I might have to use two or three pen points in that page, not because I break it, but because all of a sudden the hairline starts to thicken or the thing doesn't flex properly. And I know people use a pen till it dies. I understand that. That's okay, but I couldn't do that. And so I would not throw those pens away. I would put them into a special box, maybe practice with them later on. But if you're, if you're capable of, of, of writing a certain level of script, you should be able to see when the pen starts and it's just not doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, and so I became really crazy about that. And even when I remember speaking to Mike or Mike wrote an article or something. So where he talked about, you know, you should have at least 10 gross boxes, you know, of, of your supply. If you're, if you're a calligrapher doing this stuff for a job. Uh, now, I will say this, a principality or a Zenarian fine writer or even a Muslim imperfection is not the nib you want to use. If you're a hardworking calligrapher doing 500 envelopes in a day, not they won't last, just won't last. You're better off with something like a, a modern, some people will use, let's say, let's say a 303, but that's real sharp, but you know, a 1060, 1068A, I think is a bill that you like to use, or one of the vintage nibs that are stiffer, just because the the, the, the principality in the muscle is so soft, it just won't put up with, you know, and some of the calligraphers, as you know, they're asked to write things on paper that just is not good for pen points or for, or for pointed pen calligraphy. Uh, and to that point, at I am picked, you know, I first went there and when people first started asking me to write, to write, you know, their name for them, it was a real fun thing to do, but they would come up with these different papers and you make your first stroke and they feather into the page, you know? And so I, after a while I stopped doing them, not because I wasn't willing to do it, but because, you know, if I couldn't get the, the, the result I wanted, I, you know, so anyway, um, I think that the, the nibs, couldn't we make them today? Yeah. I think the Leonard principle is a good nib. But you have to be real careful about the, 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 the structure of the slit and the size of the nib tines. And if it's real scratchy, it's a problem, you know, because they don't really treat those points anymore at the tip. They really never did. They punch them out, fold it, you know, bend the nib. And um, if it's good, it's good. If it's not, you do it. And a lot, a lot of people don't realize it's a bad nib. And they're, they're frustrated because they're stabbing into the paper. It's not writing well. So I've got articles on how to prepare the nib and how to check it and stuff like that. I like the layout of that, and I'm no expert in layout, but I like the layout of that. So that person, yeah. Oh, I think everybody who showed me should continue to do it. I don't want to make it seem like I'm only picking one person to continue. <laughs> you know, I do this for a reason, and that's to encourage people. And I think it's a great statement. I always tell people, just write. Forget, pick up your pen. Just, just write. You know, and especially when it comes to fountain pens, if we don't write, why are we going to need pens in the future? You know, I mean, this is a specialized form of pen. And just so you people listening to this know, you do not have to use an oblique pen holder to do this kind of script. Mm -hmm. It makes it easier once you learn how to use the oblique pen holder. But remember, round hand, or what people incorrectly call copper plate, was done with a straight feather quilt pen. Platt Roger Spencer started Spencerian script with a straight feather quilt. He preferred to use feathers. You know, when his sons and daughters started teaching the, the hand, they used a straight pen holder with the Spencerian number one. The Spencerian mm -hmm. number one nib was, was made sometime in the 1850s for that specific hand, but it was done with the straight pen holder. It wasn't until later on in the 1800s, the end of the 1800s, where all of a sudden people started using the oblique pen holder. And then you get people like Mataraz and, and Taylor, who now elevates Spencerian script into this almost art form. Well, it is an art form, but I'm sorry, almost like pure art, where Spencerian was handwriting. Ornamental penmanship is, but it starts to almost leave that realm and go into pure art. So um, 
no, I, I like the layout of the one, but again, I don't want to make anybody think I didn't like their work. It was all pretty. Everybody should continue doing this. Um, and, you know, as I tell people, I'll close with the thing I tell people all the time, you know, pay it forward. You know, what you learn, teach what you've learned and, um, you know, be kind to people. Just I, I, I would never criticize anybody's work. People have criticized my work, but, you know, the, the idea is you put it out there. So you're sometimes asking for feedback. Um, but if you're going to study, it's always best to study from one style in the beginning. Once I got to a certain point with my with my ability with the pen, I could pretty much emulate almost any form of, of grocery script or in round hand within reason. Uh, you have the skill to be able to do different kinds of things. I couldn't do ornamental penmanship because I don't didn't have the movement down. But you know, start with one instructor and don't start listening to everybody else. If you start with my work, learn it and then move on. If you start with David Grimes or Nina or uh, this, yeah, I just seen a gal in India. I forget her name now, but uh, Ashka. Yes, I think so. Yeah, you know, stick with one thing for a while, and then and, and, and trying to learn that the way in which the the, the 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 teachers of penmanship in the past would do this is they would start people off with like plain penmanship, and then once you can do that, it's only a small jump to go into ornamental penmanship. Because now you're putting shades into the basic forms. Uh, people would start off learning in grocery script, and that's what they did. I mean, Bill Lilly, when he went to Disneyland College, he learned in grocery script, and I think German, I think German text lettering. He was known for both of those things, plus flourishing. So, uh, but you know, stick to something, learn the fundamentals, and then if you want to branch out and do other things, you can do that. But you have some foundation. You don't build a, a, a skyscraper on a swamp. You build it on a strong foundation. And so get that foundation in. I never really moved off the foundation. I just found so much joy in that in that particular form that that's what I pretty much stayed with. But, um, you know, and I've, I've been doing some flourishing, not letter flourishing, but even with that, when you start doing flourishing, people like the pretty stuff, you know, all of the squirrels and curls. But remember, when you're looking at the old work, they had rules to how to do that, you know, horizontal baseline ovals and you know, keeping things in a slant angle. If you just want to put a bunch of swirls, go ahead and do it. That's, if it makes you happy, do it. But if you're trying to emulate Louis Madaraz or, or Lupfer, there are rules you have to follow to do that. And, um, but again, keep it fun. Keep it fun. I will show you one right now. Um, mm -hmm. What I'm doing now is, is, is plain penmanship and fountain pen work. Mm -hmm. um, but there was one I wrote recently that was basically. Uh, uh, um, so what that says is be silent or let thy words be worth more than silence. And that was by Pythagoras from 570 B.C. to 495 B.C. That's one of my favorite things right now. And anything that involves the word love, empathy. Um, if somebody wants to try and write that, it'd be great. I could send you a, a digital scan of it as well. Uh, and I don't pretend that this is perfect, but it's the best my hand can do at this at, at this point in my okay. life. I think in this in this world and age, I mean, it, it, it's important. You know, people like to talk a lot, but make mm -hmm. sure you mean something.